Hello and welcome back to Talk About Strange. I got another great episode for you today. Uh, I got a couple really good stories you're going to want to hear. I mean, these are really good stories. Um, and uh, it's this one. And then after this one, I'm going to be doing another one right after this that is actually going to ask you for some help. Um, so you're going to want to tune into that next episode that I'm going to upload right after this one. Uh, really cool stuff. It's going to be a lot of fun. And we're looking for, for information. The person that wrote in to me is looking for information out there. So you guys might be able to help. There's a lot of experts out there that have a lot of information. And um, if you could share that, that, that would be great. Uh, I don't have a lot of updates. Um, it's still windy. <laughs> it's been windy. I don't know what's going on. This morning it has seemed pretty good and settle and then all of a sudden towards the afternoon here it's just getting more and more um harder winds so but uh, you know whatever we'll deal with it i mean there's a lot more people out there dealing with a lot worse than we are right now i've seen some real bad snow out there um we got another shirt we uh my daughter got done and put that on the store i shared my story on talk about strange and it's there with logo. It's really awesome. So uh, you guys out there that shared your story, you might want to get on there and get a t-shirt or a sweatshirt. Um, pretty soon they'll be on the mugs as well. So look out for them. Uh, if you haven't got a membership, join that membership. It really helps the channel. And you get to save some money at the same time if you want to go on the store and buy some stuff. That membership fee, will, the discount will cover your membership fee with no problem. Okay, so I'm going to move right on to the story from there. Steve, my name is not important. However, for my oh, however, for my encounter, call me Bill. First, I'd like to say thank you for making this platform Bill. I heard Wendy and all the other folks' stories and found some courage to share my story with you. To Wendy and her team, be safe and God bless. My story begins at Nantahala just outside of Bryson City, North Carolina. This summer I was 18. Our area was getting ready for the 1996 Olympics. Now, if, if the Natahala sounds familiar, my story begins a year before Eric Rudolph. Okay, I don't know of any of this, but it does all sound familiar. It was not unusual for me to go into the woods a couple weeks at a time to hike and just enjoy nature. My first couple days was not very active. I met other folks and even camped with other group of Native Americans the third night. It was here I was asked, are you going to hike out with us tomorrow? I answered no, that it would be several days before I leave. This made them uncomfortable. However, they wished me well. The next morning we set out, said our goodbyes and I was given a slight warning. Once you circle the back side of the kitchen pass, don't climb the Old West Trail. I assured them I'd be fine and was on my way. The fifth day in was when things began to change. That evening I was at the trail and I, I, was, I was warned about. However, I wanted to climb at least a couple hundred feet. Not seeing any harm, off I went. When I was maybe 270 feet in, the lights went out. I came to about dusky dark with a major headache. As the haze in my eyes cleared, I found I was on a ledge. In fact, I was facing west. I could tell the sun was going down. I rolled, I rolled slightly to one side where I found I was laying in front of a cave. Now, I knew this cave was active. I also knew I'm not alone on the ledge. I moved very delicately and took inventory of myself. My pack was not on my back. I slid my right hand down my side and was relieved to find my 14-inch bowie knife had not been removed from my side. I slowly sat up and found that the earth was spinning. My head was pounding and I was sure I had, a, I, I wasn't sure if I wasn't dead. When I went to stand up, lights out again. I woke up again in the cave. It was pitch black. I had simply passed out when I stood up. A concussion was obvious. I could hear movement in the cave. Someone or something was doing its best not to spook me. Oddly enough, my pack was right by my, beside me I felt for my, the front of it and found my mag light. This was the 90s mag light, a six cell cop style. I turned it on and started slowly sweeping it across the cave with it. Then she came into light, a girl, a woman. I was able to see her age was probably about 20, 20 to 24. She was dirty and unkept and the light freaked her out. She lunged at me and spoke, Steve. She said no. 
So I turned out the light. The next morning I woke up to chatter outside the cave as the sun was leaking over the top of the cave. It was getting close to midday. This time I stood up and stayed up. Honestly, at this point I got mad, real mad. I took a quick inventory of my bag, finding everything was there. I tossed my bag on my back, pulled out my knife, and stormed out of the cave, only to find myself eye to stomach with what I, all, I was hoping was the woman's pet bear. Not the case at all. I knew I was looking at a Bigfoot. He was eight to nine feet tall. The woman grabbed my arm with the knife in my hand and pulled it behind my back. No, she whispered. As I stood there looking at who I came to call Big One or Big, Big Un, for short, Big, he stepped out of the ledge and pointed for me to follow. So I did. I followed as we traveled west. On the eighth day, my fear began to ease and we found ourselves a nice, wide, deep spot in the creek. Between this, his smell, her smell, and now my smell, I peeled off my clothes and got in the water. This made Big mad, so he walked off into the trees. I reached for my bag and carried it out onto a big rock. Then in a few moments, I was naked and washing. I was using a small bottle of Best Western shampoo that made its way into my bag, laugh out loud. As I rinsed out my hair, I noticed that she had also gotten into the water. She was wearing what I assume was once a dress or a burlap sack. She came straight at me. The smell of the shampoo, I was certain, was more than she could ignore. I made a motion for her to go under the water and get her hair wet. She hesitated, then pulled off the sack and placed it on a rock. At least it got washed some. Soon I had her hair washed and her body was next. Her body. That was my assurance that she was in fact in her 20s or so. Later I found out she was in her 30s. Steve, she was drop-dead gorgeous. Her body was what you'd call today full-figured, but not husky or even heavy. Just well-toned and muscular. Her hair was jet black. Her skin was brown and tan. She had scars on her back and her stomach. I didn't want to know exactly why she had them. Soon I was laying naked on a rock, sunning. Why worry about modesty at this point? She got up on the rock with me. I finally asked her right out, do you understand what I'm saying? Some, she answered. I said, do you have a name? I can't remember. We talked about a bit. I found out that her mother had been taken by Big and his clan, and her mother had given birth to her in the woods. When she was around 13 or 14 years old, her mother passed away. Big and his clan had finished raising her, of course. I asked, why didn't you leave? She said she had tried long after her, not long after her mother died, and then again some years later. Big's mate had attacked her and stopped her, hence the scars. I asked where they were taking me, and she said to the clan. I asked why, with knots in my stomach. She just shrugged her shoulders. About 15 minutes went by, and I asked how long till we get to the clan. The best I could figure, in about two days, we would begin to climb the peak. Soon nature took its course with her. I guess I should have named her Ferraro, like Ferraro Rocket Candies. <laughs> I was laying there making my escape plan, which I was coming to grips with. I would have to attack Big with my knife and hope for the best. Soon Ferraro let curiosity get the best of her, and she had grabbed my friend and was examining him. I could not handle that, so I got dressed and was red in the face, I'm sure. Dressed, we found a nice spot to lay down. Big was not with us. However, my nose said he had been through the area and was not far away. We found some berries she had picked and opened two cans of my Vienna sausages and a pack of crackers. She ate it, but I'm not sure at all if she liked it. After we ate, built a fire, I heard a growl in the, in the forest. She said they didn't like the fire. I told her, oh well. Honestly, Steve, I was beginning to care less and less about what Big cared for. Anyway, I rolled out my sleeping bag and we began to doze. Soon she was nude in my sleeping bag with me. I spent about 20 minutes trying my best to explain to her why this was an absolute bad, very, very, very bad idea. I caved, Steve. It happened. I actually, and actually it happened a few times that night. She seemed to like this new activity she found. I'll stop and say here, I have carried a lot of shame around 
because of this. She was beautiful, she was mature, and I felt and still feel guilty. In the early morning hours, I had talked through a couple of escape plans. Then she asked, you leave? I said, no, we leave. I woke up next to the side of the road, about 20 miles away from the parking area. I suppose Big was listening and didn't like the idea of me taking her. I got a ride back to my car and went to the emergency room and got my head sewed up. For some reason, I think he meant to kill me this time when he hit me. I do have another story linked to this one and I would love to, to tell it sometime. I never seen Ferraro again, however, I was summoned to the Cherokee Reservation about three years after that. Perhaps I can share this story. Anyway, thanks for listening. I wish that everyone could be as good hearted as you, Steve. As for my shame and guilt, I learned how to swallow it. I got married and have three kids. Well, four. The fourth I would never get to see, as I said, part of another story. God bless, stay warm, your friend Bill. Wow. That's awesome. That's amazing. Um, and that goes a long way toward Jane's story. It sounds, you know, so much like it. I mean, this woman was raised out there. Um, she was fortunate that she learned some English from her mother before her mother died. Um, that's amazing. Uh, it's amazing that you lived. I can't believe it. He meant to kill you. I don't know. I don't, I don't think he meant to kill you. I'm wondering what he meant to do. If he meant for you to be her mate, maybe even there. And uh, but he, the idea of yeah, if you taking her and leaving, he's like no, and just you know knocked you out, dropped you off, so you wouldn't know how to get back where they were going. Uh, but I think if he meant to kill you, you'd be dead. You wouldn't have been found. So that's usually how it goes. Or it would look like a bear attacked you and killed you. Stuff along that line. Anyway, that's awesome. Thank you for sharing that. We, we definitely would like to hear the other stories. And uh, I, I got a little hint here that, that the uh, Cherokees had something to share with you. So um, that, that's intriguing. So uh, send us those stories, everybody. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the story. Uh, send your love and, and support here like you always do uh, to uh, Bill for sharing his story with us. We really appreciate it. I'm going to close this out and then I'm going to get on to that next story. So I'll see you again really soon.